Welcome to the Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, a production of LibertyNation.com, hosted by Mark Angelides. In literature, one of the most argued over genres is that of the dystopian fiction. While other book styles have produced their own share of adjectival language, think Dickensian or Homeric, there are a few more instantly understandable than those of the anti-utopian novelists. For example, Orwellian, Big Brother, Ultraviolent. Uh, how is it that these types of novels become so entwined with our culture that they become accessible language that even non-readers are comfortable using? Perhaps the answer is that a proper dystopian novel is not quite as fictional as we may hope. There are hundreds of novels in the genre, uh, beginning with Gulliver's Travels in 1726, followed a uh, hundred years later by Mary Shelley uh, of Frankenstein fame and, and her novel, The Last Man, uh, published in 1826, which described the 21st century in the wake of a deadly pandemic. From there, the, the seed caught and this particular brand of fiction bullied its way into the public psyche, never to look back. I want to examine the five big beasts of the genre and figure out why it is that they seem so timeless and altogether unlikely to drop from sight. 1984 was the best-selling book on Amazon in January 2021, with an almost 10,000% increase in sales over the last five years. The other, in my opinion, four greats are doing almost as well. Why is it that we have an enduring fascination? Why do we keep coming back to these stories generation after generation? Many of these books have a tyrannical edge or protagonist, uh, often set in a dark future, and this seems to be enough, uh, especially if there's a technological element at play, to include them in the canon. But not all have the longevity or their earned place in popular culture. Take the Hunger Games series by uh, Suzanne Collins. It's loosely based on the ancient Greek myth of uh, Theseus and the, the Minotaur, the first of the trilogy published in 2008, it was an immediate success and soon on its way to becoming a blockbuster movie. But does it have the staying power to be seen as one of the greats? Perhaps not. You see, to be a true dystopian classic, we must be able to feel the weight of portent of possibility. We must be able to see that the, the terrors described are a mere stone's throw from our current predicament. It's the impending possibility that we're getting ever closer to the events or a version of them with no way of turning back. My choices for the big five of dystopian classics are 1984 by George Orwell, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, and The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. Each of these has been selected because the terrors they propose seem all too possible, or even probable. Let's start with Clockwork Orange. The idea that our cities could become no-go zones of violence by savage gangs intent on home invasion and destruction is not a futuristic theme. It's a reality for many people. But the more pernicious aspect is the government's effort at curing the dark protagonist, Alex, of his violent ways. Written in 1962, the world was all too familiar with the idea of re-education at the hands of powerful leaders. It was something that had happened in the recent past and something to be watched for in the future. Here's a quote. If he can only perform good or only perform evil, then he is a clockwork orange, meaning that he has the appearance of an organism lovely with color and juice, but is in fact only a clockwork toy to be wound up by God or the devil, end quote. Is this not reminiscent of the absolutism with which each side of the political divide exoriates their opponent? Nothing good can be done by those who do not support us, they say. Uh, they treat each other as nothing more than clockwork oranges, uh, simple machines programmed one way or the other. It's this dehumanization we see writ large each and every day, that is infused in the story. It resonates with us because we see the precursors once again. During the last few years, we've seen 
campaign officials for Bernie Sanders caught on camera saying that the Trump supporters and Republicans of all stripes would have to be sent to camps. We've had high-level Democrats talk of re-education. And to any thinking person, it should be a terrifying prospect. Clockwork Orange is still powerful today because it describes what we see around us and what we fear is just around the corner. Now, no list of uh, dystopian classics would be complete without Orwell's 1984. It's a, a bleak vision of the future that was meant to be an extension of Stalinist Russia, the, the concrete, the party, the hate mongering. But it had the added element of technological surveillance, meaning that people could not even be free in their own homes. And what do we have now? Electronic devices in almost every room that can and do record our conversations even when supposedly turned off. Cell phones that, even when in powered off position, continue to provide tracking data. And let's look at Scotland's recent hate crime laws. Uh, hate crime, there, there is an Orwellian word if ever there was one, whereby individuals can be prosecuted for conversations they have in the privacy of their own homes. Some would suggest that 1984 is not so much a portent of the future, but a grim reflection of the present. The next choice is Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, um, regarded by many as a subcategory of this dystopian genre, a feminist dystopian. This 1985 novel has never really been out of the limelight since it was first published. It tells of a, a time when pollution and radiation have rendered much of the North American population infertile. A religious group by the name of Sons of Jacob have seized power and enforced control over how, when, and whom the remaining fertile women can breed. It's easy to see that this is a novel that follows the all too familiar cry of bad patriarchy, bad Christians, and of course, bad men. But that does Atwood a, a very grave disservice. In both her novel and numerous subsequent interviews on the subject, that the she explains that the events described have pretty much already happened in some corners of the world. Uh, think of Afghanistan before the revolution or, or Iran after their revolution. She also points out the fact that she's not criticizing religion, but rather those who usurp religion in the name of power. Is it so far-fetched to consider that there may be politicians and parties that wear their religiosity on their sleeves, yet engage in acts wholly outside the realms of almost any mainstream belief system. That's it for this edition of The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose. Join us next week for the final two dystopian classics, where we'll be discussing not only why these books have stood the test of time, but why, precisely, they're the two that are closest to our present-day reality. We hope you'll join us. Thank you for being here. The Rabbit Hole is a production of LibertyNation.com. Who are we? We are Americans that believe in liberty. We are a project of the nonprofit One Generation Away. We are patriots who apply the founding principles to the issues of today. And they keep moving the goalposts on us. We are educators and commentators who love America and the Constitution. Who are we? We are Liberty Nation. The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, a LibertyNation.com production. Available at Libsyn, Apple iTunes, Stitcher, on Roku, and other fine podcast providers.